Yeah, we didn't know how these chairs would sit, but Peggy wanted a stool, uh, a stool with a back on it. She says, I can't sit on a stool. I'll fall off the back if I put my knees up. I said, all right, we'll bring some from home. So these are our chairs from home, but they didn't fit the stool. So, we might end holy. Up, <laughs> <laughs> we might end up standing. Well, we, we wanted to, last week I started a, a, a series, a double series on marriage because of Valentine's Day. So I shared with you, how many of you here last week? Okay, good. A few of you don't know, get the tape or go online, watch. And, uh, and we just started a series about marriage and what it's supposed to look like, which is paradise. And that all discouraged us. <laughs> <laughs> but we found out that the real path to paradise is through the scripture that says we are to be giving and submitting in our relationship. And by doing so, it actually overcomes all of the enemy's tactics against our life to steal our paradise. And we didn't always have paradise in our relationship. Mm -mm. And we don't have it 100% of the time. And uh, so we, we struggled with it. In fact, talk just a little bit about our beginning, what you were going to share. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm happy to be joining him today and speaking with you. And it is our prayer that no matter what your status is, whether you're single and hoping um, to be married or if you're married or perhaps divorced, um, wanting to get married again or even widowed, we pray that you come away with some sort of nugget that can help you and your relationships from here on out. So um, we, we've been married 41 years and um, we um, had a long distance relationship in, in our dating and in our engagement. It was long distance. So we thought we were getting to know each other through long distance. Now this was in the day not too long ago, you guys, where there was no cell phone, no uh, social media, no um, uh, FaceTime, and we wrote letters and had long distance phone calls where we spent a lot of money. Well, he did mainly because I was broke. at Bible school and broke and trying to, mm -hmm. but anyway, and he wrote the most romantic letters. So I thought it was going to be like that, like all the time, just like marital bliss, you know, until, and then not only that, so I graduate and, you know, we're already pastoring. So I've never known life in our relationship without being in ministry. So that's a, that's a whole big trip in and of itself. And so we're, we're, pastoring and now we're planning a wedding so i go to illinois to plan a wedding and he is in um iowa until like two days before the wedding by the way when she said that 80 percent of pastors quit because ministry is too hard on their family yeah that's sad yeah so that gives you a little context as yeah. to how she said you know we got married and we were in ministry it was boom just like that yeah yeah so true and so anyway um so about, you know, never in the three or four years of our relationship were we in the same town, community, house for longer than a week, maybe a month. No longer than that, right? So two days before the wedding, well, we had picked out a house to live in. And some of you old timers that have been around, you've heard this story. And so some of you new folks um, will get to hear the story all over again because it was a true test of time. He, we looked at a house to rent in Harlan, Iowa, where we were pastoring, and we had agreed upon this house. And while I was in Illinois planning our wedding, he decided without me, without talking to me, without asking me, he decided to rent a two-bedroom government-subsidized apartment because it was $20 cheaper a month. Now... <laughs> It isn't that I don't mind living in an apartment. It wasn't that it was government subsidized because the Lord knew we would need that because <laughs> we were not making a lot of money. Uh, so when he came and we're like getting ready to get married, he informs me that night. Oh, by the way. Which I, I thought was good news, by the way. <clears throat> By the way, I wanted to let you know that uh, instead of the house, I rented a two-bedroom apartment because it's $20 cheaper, and uh, it has orange carpet. 
And I went, you didn't think that you needed to, like, even talk to me about this or ask me or... I mean, you know, that might not be a big deal to maybe some of you, but it was a big deal to me. I thought, is this the way it's going to go the rest of our life? And, and I was shocked that she didn't trust me. <laughs> right? Well, so obviously I got angry, and, um, and this is what he did. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> I would recommend none of you doing that. And I said, you haven't even seen Satan yet. <laughs> you think this is Satan? You just wait, buddy. So I decided not to cast it out because it would come back seven <laughs> times worse. This is true. I'm telling you, I was so upset. I said, I can't marry you. How can I marry you? Or, like, I'm not a part of any major decision. I cannot marry you. So what do you do? What do you do? We prayed. Well, that's all we knew to do, but that's all we need to do is we prayed. And, um, and, and we asked the Lord to help us. And hindsight, of course, it's funny, and we do laugh about it. This is where I got my disdain for orange, the color orange. <laughs> I have strong disdain for it. I've gotten better over the years. But anyway, <laughs> here, here we were ready to promise each other some pretty big things, right? But the biggest thing is that we were going to promise to trust each other with all of our heart, all of our life. And so while we prayed, we decided, okay, and mainly me decided, I needed to honor him and I needed to trust him because I knew that I loved him, but now can I trust him? And can I trust him with my life? And once we decided that and he gave me a diamond necklace, I was okay. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. The point is selfishness is, a, selfishness is a destroyer to the relationship. In my selfish mindset, I thought, I'm making a great decision for our family. I'm making a great decision for our financial health. I'm making a great decision for our marriage, and surely she'll be thrilled. It was so self-centered, right? But I didn't see it as selfishness. I saw it as being the man of the house. Last week, we talked about this idea of what God really wants to see in marriage, which is his image. A reflection yes. of God. That's what marriage is supposed to be, a reflection of God. That the image of God is love, honor, generosity, pleasure, and power or dominion. The image of God is love. God is love. The image of God is honorable. He is honorable above all. The image of God is generosity. No one gives like God. The image of God is pleasure at the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore. The image of God is power. He is almighty. This is the image reflected in marriage. So Satan despises it. He hates yes. God. So if you're, the marriage is the image of God, of course he wants to destroy it. He'll attack it. He'll use all that God has created against you. Like wealth. Wealth is from God. It's good. But Satan will take wealth and try to use it against you. Create greed, lust, craving, I need more. This is what I worship. This is, this is what will make me feel important. And wealth becomes destructive to your life. So it is with marriage. What God creates, Satan wants to twist so that he can use it against you. So marriage is God's idea to experience love, honor, generosity, mm -hmm. pleasure, power. These are God's images in your relationship. So today, we want to take that a little bit further and just use some details that will help you. Uh, details meaning how does this flesh out? How do, we, how do we get this love in our marriage? How do we find this power dominion is together? Yeah. God made us male and female, the Bible says, which was different but not opposite. Right. Different but not opposite. Everybody say, my spouse is different. Yeah, don't say it like that. <laughs> My spouse is different, right? My spouse yeah. is different, but we're not opposite. It's like two pieces of a puzzle. Right. They're different. They don't look the same. They're different, but when you connect them, they become one. 
Yes. They show a whole picture. If the puzzle competes against each other, it never connects. It never shows the oneness that God has provided for us. So even though we're different, we're not meant to compete against each other. We're meant to complete yes. each other. Yeah. So Adam and Eve experience this oneness in their differences, knowing love, honor, pleasure, generosity, and dominion. They ruled together. It's so... It's important to note, too, that um, in, in the Garden of Eden, Eden was Eden because of the presence of God. He walked with them. He was with them. So that should tell us something, that it was the paradise because God was with them. They talked to him. He, he, was, he, he was with them. And the presence of God is within us. So we need to put him center and focus on him in our relationships if we want to have paradise. It's very true because he's the one who changes us, not your spouse. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for that burst of enthusiasm yeah. right there. Yeah. Yeah. So in doing this, what we wanted to share with you today is this idea that you have to recognize that you're going to have an enemy working against this image of God in your life. And you don't see him. You can't see the devil. You can't, he's not coming into your house with a little pitchfork and horns on his head. No, he's coming in through the very opposite of God's image. Instead of love, he comes in with fear. Fear of rejection. Fear of not being accepted. Fear of not being trusted. Fear they'll take advantage of me. All kinds of fear. He uses it to destroy. Or instead of honor, he uses dishonor, right. demeaning, talking down to one another, um, uh, pushing each other away from each other. Instead of honor, he wants to create dishonor. Instead of generosity, he wants to create selfishness. Mm -hmm. It's my way or the highway, you know. You don't do this, I'll never have sex with you for the rest of your life. It's in other, instead of being generous, we find ourselves selfish. So Satan attacks you that way. Without a horn, without a pitchfork, mm -hmm. he's coming in unseen to get you to lend yourself to his tactics instead of God's paradise. So, Ephesians 5 is where we left off last week. Ephesians 5 is the marriage chapter, 12 verses that really talk about this idea of submitting and giving. In fact, it starts off that way. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Not taking from one another, not beating each other up. Submitting yourselves one to another yeah. in the fear of God. It wasn't until... We sat down and prayed about our conflict in our, in our apartment versus the house that we were able to submit one another mm -hmm. and actually make it work. Did we stay in the apartment? Yes, yes. we did. We Two did. years. And it wasn't, it wasn't great. We if, were the only married couple in this apartment complex, all single moms, which prepared me for what I'm doing today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we became he, he parents. He became to a lot of, yeah. father to all these little children out in the playground. <laughs> yeah. Realize that's symbolic. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have multiple wives. Just, <laughs> just wanted to clarify that. Okay. True, thank you. <laughs> so in God making us different, we strive for love. We strive for honor. We strive for generosity. We strive for power, his dominion in our lives, as well as his, um, as his pleasure. So how do we give and submit? What is this? We cannot change what is happening externally in our marriage unless we're willing to change the internal programming that crafts those results. That's right. You can't change the outside without changing the inside. The expectations we have in marriage is that it will be some sort of fairy tale, like Peggy described, yeah. wonderful, never a bad moment, perfect bliss, always and forever. This is the way life will be. But it's not the way life will be. There'll be attacks against you. And if you're going to get married, Jesus said, you better count the cost because it's an incredible journey of love and joy and pleasure and dominion. But you better know that you're in a battle that right. somebody wants to destroy this relationship. Yes, yes, so the yes. expectations we have in marriage are sometimes false, meaning that, you know, we think, you know, when I married Peggy, I thought she was the perfect person, right? When Peggy married me, she thought up until two days before the marriage, I was right. the perfect <laughs> person, right? 
And so, you know, perfect plus perfect equals perfect, right? Except the problem was Peggy was imperfect. Right. And Mani was imperfect. And guess what imperfect plus imperfect equals? Imperfect. Imperfect. Yeah. And so when you have imperfections, then you have to decide how are we going to have paradise in our home? Because when this happens with these imperfections, and everybody looks straight ahead, don't look at your spouse, don't look at anybody else, but just look straight ahead and say for a moment, I'm imperfect. Go ahead, just say it. And then say out loud, so is my spouse. Don't look at him. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're imperfect. And so that idea of imperfection creates imperfections in the way that we want, right? So when this happens, what comes into our life is disappointment. Yep. And through disappointment comes hurt. And through hurt comes anger. And through anger comes bitter. Right? So now you see the trajectory. Oh, all I have to do, Satan says, is get them to disappoint each other. And I can take them down the road to bitterness in their home to the point is, I married the wrong person. This is never going to work. They won't change. I'm perfect and they're not. Gag me with a place setting. Right. You know, I, we can be encouraged, though, that though this seems like a cycle, it just keeps going and going, um, that negative cycle, we can be encouraged to know that it takes two to keep that cycle going, but really one can start changing. It only takes one to start to be so determined that you're going to change this negative cycle in your life. That's true. Yeah. And one can do it. In fact, Peter talks yeah. about this in chapter 3 where he says the wife can actually win her husband by what she does with her mouth. With her mouth, her manner of life. That's the reason the title for this message is Less Tongue in Your Marriage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just giving you a chance to think about that a second. Which I didn't agree with the title of the message, <laughs> but we have so many examples we could give you just over this message, but it's okay. That's right. I'm, I'm typing up the message, right, because he hand writes it all, and I can't read his writing, so I was typing up the message, and my office is next to his, and then Josh's office that is next to his, and I'm like, the tongue of the less tongue in your marriage, we're not even talking about that. What does that mean? And Josh starts laughing, and I go, why are we titling the message that? And then I'm like, how many times are you going to say loving and blah, 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 because I kept having to type it over and over and over again. Josh goes, I love this. This is great. I'm like front row to these two talking back and forth to their offices. Yeah. So, why did I call it less tongue in your marriage? Because the tongue actually brings life or death, right? The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.10, you should mark it down because you can read it later, yeah. that he that loves life and wants to see good days, paradise, let them refrain their tongue from evil and their lips that they speak no guile and eschew evil it means to to be empty or avoid evil and do good. Let them seek peace and chase it. Have you ever sought peace with your words? Mm. Sought peace with your words? Proverbs 18.21 is another verse of Scripture. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Those that love it will eat the fruit of it. Whoso finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Yeah. One time I was teaching on marriage and there was, it was in a men's meeting and the men were sitting right up front while I'm preaching on this verse of scripture, God, death and life are in the power of the tongue. He who finds a wife, obtains favor of the Lord. This guy said right out loud, he goes, oh God, don't do me no more favors. <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget it because when he said it, he thought he was saying it to himself. And, but everyone <laughs> stopped and I just looked at him. Everybody started laughing. He goes, did I say that out loud? I said, yes, sir, you did. Get on your knees and repent right now, right? What if our tongues, think about this for a moment, what if your words spoke love, spoke honor, spoke generously, spoke pleasure, spoke dominion? What if your words spoke those things instead of hate, anger, dishonor, 
selfishness, right? And what if in the midst of our disappointments and uh, disagreements, we spoke love and honor? That would be or bring paradise to our relationship, wouldn't it? Even if we're disappointed, even we, if we're having a disagreement, we can still express honor, respect, love. Sometimes I'm appalled at the words that are spoken in homes, in Christian homes, um, where you wouldn't even speak these words out in public. And then the sad part is um, our children hear them. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that we always endeavored to do. <clears throat> now, our, our kids would see us argue or disagree, um, and we wanted them to learn how to come to some sort of, but we never, ever wanted them to hear us ever bring dishonor or disrespect to each other because guess what? Then they'll, in return, do that back. It's, it's, a, it's a bad situation to get ourselves into. Mm -hmm. And we didn't always do it 100% right either. Right. You know, and, uh, and sometimes we'd have to apologize to our kids and say, you know, Mama, I remember one time we got in a big argument. I have no idea what it was about, but the reason I remember it is because our kids were a little bit older, meaning um, 9, 10, you know, years old. And, of course, we had six of them, so they're all spread out. But it was the 9, 10-year-olds that came to me later and said, are you and Mommy getting a divorce? Hmm. Well, no, why would you even think that? Well, it sounded like it today, you know. Uh -huh. And so, so we just had to gather and say, you know, we're sorry that we, you know, that you saw us argue in a way that you didn't see us resolve that difference and, and treat each other wrong because mommy and daddy are never going to get a divorce and you can feel safe with that because so many of their friends, mm -hmm. you know, and so they're, they're used to being around a bunch of friends that had divorce. So... These are, these are issues that create the divisions and hurt our marriages. So why, 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 are, why do we have so much trouble talking to each other? Because we're different, right? And, and, we, and we don't always fit in the right, we're trying to figure out how to fit. There, there is a way to make it fit, but sometimes we find the wrong, the wrong place that we're trying to fit, and then we can't, we can't become one. Why is this difference so huge? Because there are differences between men and women. And these differences are how God created us, male and female. Not opposite, just different. One's not right, one's not wrong. We're just made to complete each other instead of compete against each other. Because men and women are different, it's not a surprise to any of us that we have in any relationship, any length of time, we'll run into these differences. However, some act totally surprised by these differences when we see them and then we start to resent it. Do you realize it's those differences that actually attract you to each other? The very things often that attract you to each other are the very things that start to bug you once you're married. If he was carefree and, and you know, off the cuff and, and he would do things and you were more rigid, more anal, you know, and you wanted to say, he was so attractive because he brought such expression into your life or vice versa. So you liked it, but not once you get married. Now you want him to stop being carefree. You want him to plan. You want him to, right? And so now you have all this, this conflict. It was the very thing that attracted you, but now brings a problem to you. However, these differences are meant to be enjoyed in your relationship, not get mad at. Instead, we spend our whole life trying to change the other person to be like us. Well, then you wouldn't want to be married to him. Who wants to be married to themselves? Right. <laughs> <clears throat> so we, we, quiet, we try to change each other. Say out loud, I need to stop trying to change my mate. Yes. Yeah, change Yeah, I can mate. tell there's a That's lot of right. confidence in your expression there. Yeah. God created us different and said it was good. Right. It was good for us not yes. to be alone, but to have these differences to complete us. Mm -hmm. So marriages aren't destroyed by difference. They're destroyed by selfish responses to that difference. Marriages are not destroyed by the differences. They're destroyed by the selfish responses to those differences. Instead of submitting and giving, we start demanding and taking right. because of the differences. Right. Is it possible that we're way, too, uh, we're way too much focused on our differences rather than how they complete us? Yeah. If you 
if you want your relationship to add to your life, then it is time we accept and appreciate and understand the differences. Just accept it. We're not going to change it. We're not going to change um, the, the way men think or the way women think. So the, more, the quicker that we can start accepting and understanding it, the better off we'll be in our relationship. So what we don't understand, you fear. And what you fear, you oppose. You're against. And what you oppose, you attack. So this is what happens in marriages. You don't understand each other. So we want to talk about, we, years and years ago, in fact, we talked on it years ago, <clears throat> we um, read a book. It's the title of a book, actually. It's been our favorite. And men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. We love that because we haven't seen any um, correlation that we like better than this. So we're going to briefly touch on it because we're out of, room, out of, out of time, mm. real close. So Go yeah, for it. we have to hurry. Go. Okay, so men um, are like waffles. What does this mean? They process their whole life. Now, the average man, okay, we're not going to group them all together. The average man processes their whole life in boxes. There's a box for his job. There's a box for his hobbies. There's a box for his wife. There's a box for his children. Or sometimes he throws them in the box with the wife. But he lives his life out of a box at a time. Now, as he matures or grows or learns and understands, he can jump from those boxes rather quickly. It, it takes some practice. So when he's at his work, He's at his work. When he's at home or with his wife, he's with his wife. So, or maybe so, not. Maybe he's still in the box yeah, of work. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. So there, there's all these boxes. This is why there is also a box of emptiness. This is why he can watch TV and totally tune, tune out the rest of the world. He can tune out the kids climbing on the drapes and getting into the fireplace. And he doesn't even hear all the screaming. <laughs> Because he, he's zoned in, right? He's in that box. He compartmentalizes all the time. Women help. And what women don't know is that we have actually had an empty box. Yes. So when Peggy says, what are you thinking about? I say nothing. I don't believe that because when we say nothing, <laughs> listen, men, this will, this will help you. You can thank me later. When women say nothing, they have a whole lot of something going on in their mind. You don't want to be in their empty box of nothing because they truly do mean nothing. They don't have anything going on in their brain. Yeah, so when I'd say to Peggy, what, what's, what's wrong? She'd go, nothing. I'm like, oh, okay. Right. That, I have that that's box. That's not what you should do. There is a whole lot going on in there. So... And, you know, and why? Why do we talk in Morse code all the time? We shouldn't do that. We should make it simple and clear because Morse code doesn't work in a, in a marriage. They, it's kind of like when I say, I don't have anything to wear, that means I don't have anything new to wear. When he says, I don't have anything to wear, it means I don't have anything clean to wear. Yeah, I didn't understand that when she had nothing to wear when the closet was full of clothes. But she understood him actually what I yep. meant when I had nothing to wear because everything was in the hamper, right? Yep. So it's just two different languages of how we learn. But when anything about the woman is that she thinks in terms of spaghetti, everything is connected. This drives me nuts. I, and I'll tell you how I, I, what I mean by this. It just happened the other night and we started laughing about it. Yes. We were talking about Tyson, our grandson, about something. And so we were talking about Tyson. I'm in the box. I, I'm, I'm there. Yep. I'm in, I, I've got it. I'm focused. But while yeah. we're talking about Tyson, she sees a, a card from the vet in the mail that, that dog the dog needs to, to be taken vet. to the vet. And so she says, and then, and then somebody was coming over for dinner that night. And so here's spaghetti woman thinking about all these things. We're talking about Tyson. She goes, oh, he needs to go to the vet on Monday. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm like, why would Tyson need to go to the vet? And then, and then she says, and they're coming down for dinner later. I'm like, are we still talking about Tyson? She's like, come on, money, keep up. Right? Well, this, you should have seen me reading the postcard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was an idiot. 
<laughs> so, no. so these are the dynamics of just our differences of how we think, well, how we Well, the focus. noodles, though, is really good because they're interconnected. There's no beginning and end. They intertwine. They're all, they, they are totally on the plate together and women actually process life that way very relational very connected in fact if they don't communicate if they're if they have a silent husband they feel disconnected because everything is connected on that plate even though you can't see the beginning from the end no, that's true it keeps running yes yes <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep sucking it in. You'll get to the end of it sooner or later, guys. But you know what? But I think, Peggy, part of that dynamic, though, is that because women take a different approach to communication than men, we, we tend to think in communication as fixing something. We're going to have a conversation because we've got a, a gender, or a goal, yeah. Where women think of communication kind of like a journey, a walk. That never ends. No, no, it, it ends. No, no. I'm, I'm teasing about it. it well, ends. because we have so many more words. It, yeah. uh, Kevin Lehman used to say, women, think about what you want to say to your husband and then, and then divide it by 10. And get to the point and don't ramble because they really want to succeed. Of course, every, they want to stay in the box they feel successful in. And if they don't feel successful in the box of communicating with you, they're not going to jump in that box. In fact, they're going to avoid it because they want success, right? So, oh, they're flashy. And women tend to be more relational than men. We tend yeah. to be more task-oriented. Uh, so, you know, men don't pick up the phone and talk for an hour to a buddy uh, unless it's about making plans to go to a game and you've got to get all the details done. But otherwise, you're not just having a conversation. Uh, women tend to be more relational than men, and so our conversations are much different. So even in conflict... The woman is working to, at that relationship where the man is just working at a solution. Right. And so those differences often create havoc for us and difficulty because we have two different agendas. And then we find our, our we lean towards anger and lean towards selfishness and get... Right, because I would get very, very frustrated um, when we would be conversing about something and he wanted to just fix it. Here, here's a one plus one equals two, do it and it'll all be better. And I would just have to say, I don't want you to fix it right now. I don't need a mouth, I need a shoulder. And I definitely don't need you to pastor me because he would just switch right away from that role to husband to a pastor. Oh, oh, I know how to do this. I'm going to pastor her. Um, mm, no, I don't, I don't want you to pastor me. I need you to listen and to understand me. Yep. And maybe that's uh, part of the goal of communication, actually, is seeking to understand before you right. seek to be understood. True. The difference is giving and taking. If we're seeking to understand, it's a giving nature. If we want to be understood, it's a taking measure. Yeah. And it creates the dynamic of, of walls being built up that you can't surpass and get to the end of where you want to be. Adding to all of these communication issues that relationships can have, let's bring in then, just for a brief moment, the problems that we have with um, the advancement of technology texting and um, all through even social media. There is no face-to-face -face conversation hardly anymore, especially with um, the next generation. Even with spouses, even with married people, they would just assume text. You know why? Because they could say whatever they want to say. You don't read their, the, you don't hear their tone. You don't hear their fluctuation. And you definitely don't see their facial expression. And there is not enough emojis out there to replace the face. Right. Have you ever like scrolled through all those emojis trying to find just the emoji to put on there? And have you ever ever been so upset that you capitalize everything that you're saying just so they know that you are upset? And then See, if you're my age, you need readers. Otherwise, God only knows what emoji you're going to send. <laughs> this is true. This is true. That's true. But anyway, it has posed a big problem in the area of communication because there's no face-to-face. -face. And we... Actually worse than... than than people actually think. Right. Technology right. is actually hurting us instead of helping us. You know, this, a child this, uh, yeah. was at school 
and yeah. uh, the parents were talking to him, and he said, I just wish I was a cell phone. And the teacher said, why would you want to be a cell phone? He said, well, then my parents would spend time with me. I know, heartbreak, right? Yeah. And then let's not even get into the topic. I'll say this one line. I really want you guys to listen to this because it's too easy for you all to um, be texting. I, I can't even begin to tell you on social media how many times I have some dude say something to me that I don't even know, which I go delete, block. But how many times are we finding ourselves texting the opposite sex or somebody at work because it's just easy to talk to them. Of course it's easy to talk to them. They don't live with you. They don't know what you're really like through that text machine. I'm telling you what, if you're texting somebody of the, or talking to somebody of the opposite sex just to gain, oh, I don't know, this feels good, they make me feel better, they, they talk, you know, they're sweet to me, oh, stop it. Stop it. It's fake. It's not real. And it opens the door for the devil. It's wrong. I'm telling you, it's wrong. Yes. And it needs to be stopped. Yeah. It's a good thing to repent from. Let, let me just finish on Ephesians chapter 5 because of our time frame today. Um, where the Bible speaks about loving your wife and the, and the scripture says, talks about wives honoring your husband. Yeah, yeah. Respecting. And, and the, reason, yes. the reason for this is, is because it's literally love and respect. Mm -hmm. Love and respect. Men, uh, ladies, for lack of better understanding, thrive on the area of respect. Wherever they're respected, they feel loved, given to. I always say, if you can't look up to them, then you don't look at them. Because respect is needed in a man, and he'll do anything to get it. And usually where he finds the most respect is where he finds his most time. So if he's respected at work, that's where he wants to be. He likes it because he gets respect there. If he doesn't find respect in his home, he doesn't want to be in the home because he's not respected there. Respect doesn't mean that you agree with them all the time. It just simply means you honor them. Women, on the other hand, need to be loved. Explain exactly what that means versus the difference. Well, uh, I believe that it's a God-given thing in the soul of a woman to be loved. This is why Ephesians said, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. he, and he also tells the husband to love their, his wives as, his, as himself. Okay, so they need that love. And <clears throat> what, so it's born in them by God, just like respect is born in their soul in, in men by God. If we feel unloved, automatically we disrespect. If we have that unloving feeling or we feel unloved, we're going to disrespect. Just like if they're disrespected, they're not going to be loving. It, again, that cycle, but it only takes one person to break that mm -hmm. cycle. It's true. And, and, and when she says it only takes one, here's, here's the dynamic. It's, pro, it's Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given. Give, and it will be given. Back to you again. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together. You can't... What, what if we work to outgive our spouse? Yeah. I'm going to be more giving than you. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give more often than you. That's my goal. Think about how that changes we're the dynamic of, of where we're at. Now, this is no different. Peggy usually sits on the front. You don't see her because she's hidden, but she's down there going like this to he me He never all the time, pays attention he? to me. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. He doesn't pay attention. I'll look back and see zeros, and then I'm like, he never looks that way. He just doesn't even look. I don't love you, do I? Yes, you do. I need to be more loving. No, you do. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make me feel unloved. It would actually help me because, because one time... One time he had a zipper down. Yeah. And I'm like, you should learn to look at me every so often. I was doing everything in my power to tell him, your zipper is down. They even had a big Z on a piece of paper. And he didn't I'm like, know. finally I stopped and said, what does Z what does mean? What does Z mean? God help us. Amen.
Let me let us pray for you. Would you let us pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ? God wants our marriages to reflect Him. It is revival in a community, yes. in a center, yes. when marriage reflects God. Yes. It brings God into people's lives. Father, thank you, Father. We need you in our homes. Thank we're not you, strong Father. enough, smart yes. enough. We're we're not big enough. We need you. There's no way we can love without your love in us. There's no way we can submit without putting you first. We find ourselves protecting, demanding, taking, angry, bitter. It begins to destroy the very fabric of paradise in our lives. And you want our homes to be filled with paradise. Yes. Forgive us. We come to you in repentance to ask you to forgive us. It's not about who's right or who's wrong. Thank you, Father. We're wrong. Yes, thank you, I'm Jesus. wrong. Thank you, Father. Because I'm not taking that first step towards giving and submitting. Thank you, Father. Today, I'm asking you, Father, for healing in our homes. Yes, Lord. Paradise. No matter what it is that we're facing, whatever difficulty, even conflict, whatever sickness or whatever lack, God, that those things don't begin the circumstances of destruction in our homes, but instead you, we find ourselves with God right in the midst yes. of our homes, you, giving Father. and receiving and receiving and giving. And I thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.